Welcome to Uncharted Liverpool, where we're going to delve into some of the more interesting and less well-known parts of Liverpool history. In this podcast, we're going to take a deep dive into some of the more obscure, little-known and sometimes just plain weird parts of Scouse history and heritage. Full disclosure, I'm a Scouser. I was born in Liverpool in the late 80s and, in my possibly biased opinion, it's one of the best cities in this country, if not the world. But aside from me loving the city I grew up in, it has some of the richest, most interesting and culturally significant histories of all the cities in the UK. The city has played an important part in the world as we know it today, sometimes for amazing reasons, sometimes world changing. But sometimes, the part it played was dark, abhorrent and shameful. We will be looking at the good, the bad, the ugly and the uncharted part of the history of Liverpool. This is Uncharted Liverpool. This episode will focus on what was known among Scousers at the time as the Ovi, or the Dockers Umbrella. The Liverpool Overhead Railway was one of the most pioneering transport schemes in the world at the time. But before we delve into that, let's take a look at the Liverpool Docks, and why they were so important to the city and the country as a whole. During the later years of the 19th century, the Liverpool Docks were growing massively in both scale and with the amount of traffic going up and down the dock roads to serve the needs of the dock. The dock road traffic was beginning to look unsustainable if the progress of the port of Liverpool was to go unhindered. The OV and the dock go hand in hand, so if we talk about the docks, we can't ignore its past. The history of the Liverpool Docks isn't a happy one. Whilst it provided a crucial shipping port for the UK, as the centuries moved forward, they started out as being a main player in the transatlantic slave trade. Liverpool was a major slaving port, and its part in the horrific history of the slave trade can't be downplayed. Throughout the 17th and 18th century, the city and its businessmen made its money by trading people. Between 1700 and 1807, it's estimated that the slave ships from Liverpool carried more than 1.5 million Africans over the Atlantic, selling people to plantation owners in the Caribbean, operating on what's known as the triangular system. The ships of Liverpool carried goods such as firearms, alcohol and textiles over to the African continent where on arrival they sold these goods in return for Africans, setting sail across the Atlantic. Once there, they traded these people for what they liked to call luxurious goods such as sugar, tobacco and coffee to be taken back to Britain and sold for profit. The money made from the slave trade in Liverpool quickly surpassed that of London and Bristol the other major port cities in Britain. By the end of the 1700s, Liverpool's slave trade accounted for a massive 80% of British slave trade and 40% of Europe's. By the start of the 19th century, somewhere between a third and half of all of Liverpool's trade was with Africa and the Caribbean. Even after the British abolition of the transatlantic slave trade in 1807, Liverpool continued to make money by buying goods from the Caribbean and America, such as cotton and sugar, all harvested by African slaves being forced to work under horrific conditions. And this is how Liverpool made its money. There's no shying away from the awful history, but the money made by local businessmen, politicians and the elite was usually from investment in the slave trade. And that money helped maintain the dock status as a crucial cog in the logistics machine way into the 1800s. So back to the docks. The dock road was becoming overly congested with both trade vehicles for the docks but also the increasing number of white collar workers commuting in and out of the city on a daily basis. Huge horse drawn carriages, hundreds of hand carts, omnibuses and lorries all competing for space and time to get into the city. 
A new solution was required. And slowly but surely, the first ideas for the Liverpool Overhead Railway, or the OV as it would be soon known, began to be drawn up. The first person to really see the issue and come up with a solution was a London man, W.H. Curtis, who visited Liverpool and quickly noticed the problems. His solution was to introduce a series of rails which the omnibuses of Liverpool could be modified to use, an ingenious hybrid solution whereby the buses could run on both the roads and at the flick of a lever on rails, and this in effect segregated the buses from the rest of the dock traffic. And whilst it was incredibly popular, it had its issues. For one, if the rails were being used by horse-drawn carriages carrying goods, the buses had to detach from the rails and rumble over the roads to overtake before getting back on the rails. In short, it worked, but it wasn't pretty. The first proper idea for an overhead railway came in 1852, when John Grantham, an engineer, proposed the idea of elevating rails between certain sections of the docks on 20-foot high columns. The scheme didn't really come to much, however, until 1877, when the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board started looking more seriously into a solution that would future-proof the dock traffic issues. Sending scouts over to New York to look into how their already established overhead railway sections worked, the Docks and Harbour Board started to draw up plans for how one of these would work along the Mersey waterfront. After many iterations and redesigns, they were eventually granted permission by parliamentary power to build an elevated railway in 1878. After a few more years of redesigns and problem solving, the Liverpool Overhead Railway Company was formed and were tasked with finally getting started on the railway. In 1888, building began, overseen by civil engineer Douglas Fox. The building, as you might expect, hit some serious snags along the way. Battles with local health committees about possibly moving some sections of the track in land, building around already established buildings, sometimes having to tear them down and pay to rebuild elsewhere. The cost of the railway was slowly increasing past budget, but the company was determined to get the project finished. The lines were built in mid-air, the workers and structures being transported along the route by a special jig, being built piece by piece. The corrugated steel sheets that formed the foundations for the tracks and platforms being slid along without causing interruption to the traffic below. By the end of 1893, the first sections had been completed, consisting of 15 stations roughly 700 yards apart from each other. And on 4th of February 1893, the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, travelled to Liverpool to open the railway in a lavish ceremony. It finally opened to the public on March the 6th, with the service initially running a five-mile stretch between Alexandra Dock and Herculaneum Dock. It was eventually extended to Seaforth Sands near Bootle, and a further terminus at Dingle, which is near Toxteth, was finalised in 1896. By this point, the OV stretched a total of six and a half miles up and down the Liverpool waterfront. The OV was the world's first elevated, electrically powered railway. But it wasn't always meant to be that way. Initially, plans to use steam-powered locomotives was the preference. But as development continued on the OV, electrically powered railways were becoming more and more popular. In 1891, the City and South London Railway opened providing an electrically powered train system to the people of London. It was a slowly developing technology that the Liverpool and Overhead Railway Company realised they couldn't ignore. There were other examples too, namely the Blackpool Tram Network System and the Volk Railway in Brighton. But the OV was due to carry thousands more passengers than these relatively small projects. Nevertheless, the decision was made to electrify the OV, and needless to say, the locals were more than intrigued. The idea of an electric railway, given the trams were being pulled by horses and the Mersey Railway was still using steam, both shocked and excited potential commuters. It was true that America already had elevated railways, but these were powered by steam locomotives, and whilst London had electric already, they were underground. The OV was there for everyone to see in broad daylight, 
no ticket parries the pass through to see its glory. It was revolutionary for the area, and Liverpool was already becoming known for being inventive and in some ways magical. The Ovi was the world's first electrically powered elevated railway. The trains on the Ovi eventually consisted of two third class coaches, with a first class trailer being pulled behind them and was able to carry 140 people per train. Trains at their peak were running every five minutes, and the total journey along the six and a half mile line took less than half an hour, which is incredible when you take into consideration that the same journey today would take 20 minutes and the trains are every 15 minutes on a good day. The third class carriages carried passengers on wooden benches, whilst the luxury of first class offered some upholstery for the better off to park their behinds while travelling. In more ways than one, the Ovi was a railway of firsts. As wear and tear on the line increased, engineers developed the world's first self-lubricating wheels to try and minimise the battering they were taking along the windy line through the docks. Seaforth Sand Station also featured one of the country's first escalators, being unveiled in 1901. It did have to get removed not long after though, because women kept complaining they were getting their dresses trapped in the mechanism. Part of the reason that the Ovi became so popular and well used was down to tourism. The railway was primarily built to ease congestion to and from the docks and to provide a commuter route for office workers in the city. But pretty much from the get-go, the overhead railway company realised that it had a huge tourism potential. It was, after all, an engineering marvel that most people in Liverpool hadn't seen the likes of as they hadn't travelled to the capital before. Early advertisements plastered around the city and nearby areas the station served featured slogans such as Magnificent Panoramic Views and A Splendid View of the Docks and River. It was true that the journey offered unrivaled views of the city. Being able to peer down into the docks and fancy ships on one side and take in the impressiveness of the city buildings on the other brought in tourists in their thousands. Special tourist round-trip tickets were issued to allow passengers a riveting afternoon on the railways. Even in 1955, the Ovi was still operating as a tourist attraction, offering round trips for around six pence per person. Author Lou Baxter interviewed Vera Fleming, a local resident, about her memories of the railway. And he writes how, in the early 50s, Vera and her cousins used to gather their children and families and take them for trips in Seaforth. They would take the tram down to the overhead station at the pierhead and buy their tickets for Seaforth. He quotes her as saying, We would buy our tickets and then climb up the staircase to the platform. The overhead was the easiest and quickest way to get to Seaforth. She laughs about how uncomfortable the ride was in third class. Well, they had wooden seats, and they were mainly for the doctors to get to work. We knew that, so it didn't matter. And the carriages were painted a dreary dark brown, I think, and certainly weren't plush like today's trains. They were very noisy as the train rattled along the lines, but it was great to look out and see the docks and river as we were so high up. And I can see the appeal myself. Even now with 30 odd, the best view on the train into Liverpool is passing the docks. And I can imagine that view all those years ago when the docks were loud and busy. The sounds, the sights, the smells. I would have paid 6p for that. The Docker's umbrella, as it was named by some scousers, was and still is fondly remembered. It provided an easy, cheap form of transport to get to and from work and days out which was much more interesting than omnibuses or trams. Of course, it wasn't all smooth rails and happy times for the passengers of the OV. World War II broke out in 1939, and Liverpool was badly affected. Britain's war effort required the port of Liverpool be kept functioning. It was a hugely important lifeline to the country, but unfortunately the Luftwaffe knew this. And Liverpool became the second most bombed city in Britain outside of London. During the Blitz of 1941, the city was bombarded with Luftwaffe air attacks, claiming 1,700 scouts lives. The damage from the blast left more than 51,000 people homeless in the city, and of course, the overhead railway did not escape damage. 
It was an easy target for the bombers, the steel tracking winding its lifted way along the docks and waterfronts. Numerous stations were damaged, James Street in particular was badly hit by bombs and it had to be rebuilt. The residents of Liverpool held firm against Hitler. He wasn't going to bring this city to a halt. It was important to keep the docks running and the people moving. Many stations had to be patched up after suffering damage. The Scousers were determined that when trains couldn't run due to line damage, buses and trams were called upon to relieve the pressure on traffic. And as you'd expect from wartime Britain, everyone pulled together to keep the port operational. The railway was deemed a massively important part of the British logistical system at this point, and so despite shortages of nearly all building materials across the country, every effort was made to get supplies to Liverpool to get damaged stations and sections of line rebuilt. After the war ended, passenger numbers had actually increased on the OV and the company took this respite to refurbish the tired and in some cases damaged carriages. Finally, third class passengers could have upholstered seats like the first class counterparts. The downfall of the OV Operating successfully for more than 50 years, the Liverpool Overhead Railway was flourishing. It had become as important to Liverpool as the docks themselves. But remember, when we told you about the construction, and the lines and platforms were laid on foundations of corrugated steel sheets, well, unfortunately, those sheets of steel caused the downfall of the OV. It was made evident, during the repairs to the line after the war, that the steel sheets had become rusted beyond repair. The exposure to the elements and pooling of water in the troughs had damaged a fundamental part of the railway so badly that its future was in doubt. In the post-war years, the Liverpool Overhead Railway Company was, like most people and businesses in Britain, struggling with cash, and when the bill for the repair of the steel structure came in at more than £2 million, it just simply couldn't afford its repair. A short-term solution, costing around 250000 4.5 million in modern money, could be achieved, but it was estimated that it would only extend the railway's life by about 10 years. Part of this, with Britain nationalising its railways in 1948, the future did not look bright for the OV. In 1955, business of the docks was dwindling, and Liverpool officials were forced to start thinking of ways to move past the railway and back to buses and trams to get people to and from the docklands. Appeals to the government for funding proved fruitless, and in July 1955, it was agreed that the railway would be shut with the final trains running on December 30th, 1956. It was a historic and sad day for Liverpool. Hundreds turned out to say goodbye to the OV and have one last ride on its winding lines. A ticket office worker at Seaforth called Stan Sude was interviewed and gave the following account of the last day of operation. I got the last train back to Dingle where I lived. There were quite a few passengers on board. All the pubs along the route emptied and people stood and waved as we passed by. The driver blew the train's whistle back to them. It was a sad day. I had been working on the railway since I was 15. I had done every job there was to do by a driver. The trains were always on time. They never broke down. Later that year, demolition work began and the OV quickly became part of Liverpool's history. There is little left standing of the overhead railway. A few metal girders can be seen embedded in the walls on the dock road near where the new Everton Stadium will stand. And that's about it. Well, apart from the Museum of Liverpool, that is. In 2011, National Museums Liverpool opened its newest museum. On the pier head, not far from where the OV ran, the Museum of Liverpool is contained within a stark, beautiful white building in keeping with the Three Graces. Showcasing the history of this great city, alongside memories of some of its past residents, they of course couldn't build a new museum dedicated to Liverpool without mentioning the Liverpool Overhead Railway. Inside the museum, roughly 20 feet above the floor, stands an actual carriage from the beloved Overhead Railway. It's a third class carriage, of course. The only one of its kind left in existence. This carriage 
ran on the railway until its closure in 1956 and was moved into the museum as one of its star exhibits. They partially designed the building in a way that would allow the carriage to be moved in and displayed as a centrepiece. It was lifted hydraulically to the height of the actual railway line and is now proudly displayed alongside the memories of the OV and exhibits on its construction, usage and eventual destruction. New generations of Scousers and visitors to Liverpool can now learn about the railway and how important it was to the city. It's how we first learned about the OV and what inspired us to do this episode. There's a stone bench dedicated to the Dockers umbrella just outside the Cunard building in Liverpool near the pier head. And if you look online, there are many, many photos and even some videos of the OV in action. We'd encourage you to take a look. This has been Uncharted Liverpool. Find us on Instagram at Uncharted Liverpool, where we will be posting some photos relating to this episode. Whilst researching this episode, we read The Docker's Umbrella, A History of Liverpool Overhead Railway by Paul Bolger. 17 Stations to Dingle, The Liverpool Overhead Railway Remembered by John Gahan. The Liverpool Overhead Railway, A Celebration of the Docker's Umbrella, A Transport First by the Liverpool Echo Nostalgia Series as well as visiting the brilliant Museum of Liverpool. I cannot recommend that highly enough. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next month for another story from Liverpool's past. Ta-ra!